infinite grace and mercy to understand what is his will in your life may your you may you be the reason for the lord's name be, to be glorified through you may the lord jesus use you to be that vessel that carries his light to this dark world and we pray more so for this sunday resurrection day to be unified throughout christendom where all christians worldwide come and celebrate the ultimate miracle which the lord performed in the flesh which is his resurrection from the dead may this day be unified and all christians come and celebrate this day which changed the history of mankind forever may they celebrate it together for the name of the lord jesus to be glorified more and more through his children before this world which is placed in the bosom of satan it's very sad at the same time for some christians there are still fasting and this year it had to be over 30 days of difference between the new gregorian calendar and the old julian calendar the Joel, julian calendar sunday resurrection i believe will be on the 5th of may and those who follow the gregorian calendar they just celebrated it today the 31st of march huge difference this year apparently next year it will be one will be united next year and it'll be in april sometime maybe the 16th of april i can't not sure don't hold me to that but it'll be sometimes in april next year it'll be together we pray it will always be together amen but don't tell anyone the old calendar is more accurate now. by the way the holy fire appears and the tomb of the lord jesus in the sepulcher church in jerusalem on the old julian calendar and it's been happening every year without fail for the last 2024 years coming up the last 2020 odd years um, <clears throat> one of the centuries our beloved muslims tried to stop the Christians from entering the sepulchre church on holy fire day so they shut the door of the church not allowing the Christians for whatever reason it was I don't know I wasn't there but this is this is true so they closed the doors of the sepulchre church not allowing the Christians to celebrate that holy fire day where the divine light appears in the tomb of the Lord divine intervention so what did the Lord do if you go and I pray you go to the Holy Land and you go to the sepulchre church right at the very very main entry the gate of the of the church there is a pillar and you will see till this very day this pillar um, a marble kind of a a carved pillar out of marble you will see it split why because the holy fire came through that pillar because of the gate being closed they thought they can stop well they stop the christians from entering but they cannot stop christ from doing what he know, what he knows my beloveds no one can stop this holy fire the Lord chose it to be on the Julian old calendar. It's not an orthodox calendar. It's the Lord's calendar. So we pray all Christians unite and unify the Sunday resurrection. But until then, from the bottom of my heart, a very happy Sunday resurrection for our beloved Catholics, Christian Catholics and all Christians who have celebrated the Sunday resurrection today um, this Sunday and to our beloved Orthodox who are still going through the great Lent period 
Um, I love you. And take it easy. We pray for the unity of the church. We pray for the unity of the Sunday resurrection. By the way, I'm Orthodox. Some people agree, disagree, doesn't matter, but I'm Orthodox. But above all, I'm Christian beyond everything else. I belong to Christ, and Christ is neither Orthodox nor Catholic nor anything. Christ is God revealed in the flesh. Very simple. Yes? God revealed in the flesh. So these names do not apply to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We can argue forth and back, back and forth, but at the end of the day, the Lord will always be the Lord, and He will always be this true divine God that was revealed in the flesh over 2,000 years. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We need to come to know Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter you're Catholic or Orthodox, but until you come and get to know the Lord Jesus, it will do you no good being a Catholic or an Orthodox. So what? You need to know the Lord. You need to have a personal relationship with the Lord. The Lord Jesus will never accept, will never accept it from no Christian to treat him as a duty or an obligation. The Lord will never accept this kind of a service. I come to serve the Lord because I'm obligated to do it because I'm a, I happen to be a Christian. Doesn't work. The Lord Jesus will accept it only in one way. When you come freely, when you choose to come by His grace and by His mercy to live Him, not to do some sort of a service for Him. No, you need to live Christ. Why? Because Christ is the source of our life. I need to live the Lord. I need to live the Lord. The gospel of today, according to our church calendar, is not about the Sunday resurrection. We're still going through the Great Lent. But since some of our beloved Christians have celebrated the Sunday resurrection today, please allow me to speak. A little bit about the Lord's resurrection. If anybody asks you what is the ultimate miracle the Lord Jesus performed in his life on earth in the flesh, say his resurrection. That's the ultimate. Because there has never been anyone throughout the human race nor will ever be anyone to come throughout the human race that happened to die and then rise from the dead on their own. This has never happened, never will happen, never will. Except one person did it. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to his holy and mighty name. He is the only human being that died and rose from the dead on his own by his authority by his power period the only grave the only tomb that is truly empty is the tomb of the lord jesus because the one who went into it is the living one because he never he never committed a mistake he never committed a crime he never sinned in his life neither with his thoughts nor with his deeds the only way death can conquer a human being when that human happens to be a sinner because this is the commandment of God to death God ordered death to rule and conquer whoever is a sinner this is why death was never able to conquer and rule over Jesus Christ and keep him in the grave why because the Lord Jesus never sinned in his life 
And this is why he was out of the grave on the third day. Because death has authority over sinners, not sinless. So the Lord entered the grave by law and came out of the grave by law. Not by force, not by power, yet he is God, he can do anything and everything. But since he is God, he can never break any law. So everything he did, he did it lawfully. Lawfully. One of our church fathers in the 12th century, Saint John, he was a monk priest. He was a monk priest in the Church of the East in the 12th century. He's putting it so beautifully, like a, a little story, but with depth in it, theological depth. He said, when the Lord Jesus went to the belly of the earth, he died on the cross in the flesh. So he's putting this scenario forth where God the Father is the judge and Jesus Christ on this side being that victim and then death, the prosecutor on the other side. And then the Lord Jesus looked at death and he said, death, why did you do this to the human race? Why did you let them rot in the grave? Why did you allow the termites to eat the bodies which are the creation of God? What happened to this beautiful creation of God? God created the human race in his image according to his likeness. Why have you made them rot in the grave? Death replied to the Lord Jesus and said, it wasn't me who conquered them. It was God who ordered me to conquer them. As long as they sin, you rule over them. And then the Lord replied to death and said, so now death, you are confessing and acknowledging that you only rule over those who sin, correct? Death replied and said, yes, correct. The Lord said then, you have no authority over me because I never sinned. I only carried the sins of mankind, but I never sinned myself. Therefore, death, you have no authority over me. Death was silent. And God the Father brought the hammer down and said to Jesus, you're innocent, come out. He is the only human ever to exist that never sinned. Every human being sinned except Jesus. The perfect Lamb of God. The perfect Lamb of God. When we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the last verse, 13, St. Paul says that three things remain in every one of us, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of all is love. The greatest of all is love. There are seven festive seasons in the church calendar. There are seven festive seasons in the church calendar. The first three is the nativity, the birth of the Lord. The second one, the epiphany, the baptism of the Lord at the river Jordan. And the third one, the resurrection of the Lord. Like so many Christians celebrated the resurrection today. The birth of the Lord, the baptism of the Lord, and the resurrection of the Lord. The birth of the Lord is hope. The baptism of the Lord is faith. The resurrection of the Lord is love. And the greatest of all is love. And the ultimate of all is the resurrection. But you see, 
Resurrection could not have been made possible unless there was birth first. So what did the, the birth give us? Hope. Hope of what? Hope of salvation. Hope of redemption. Hope of resurrection. Gave me the hope. And without hope, there is no going forward. When a person, far from all of you, when a person loses hope, they end up killing themselves, commit suicide. Why do people commit suicide? Because they lost hope entirely. The moment I have no hope in me, I have no life in me. Finished. That's why it's very easy to take it away. Take that life away. Hope is that force, is that drive that keeps on pushing you forward, yet you are going through extreme, difficult, hardship, and troublesome times. Hope. Hope is like a window that allows the light to enter this dark room. When we go through a lot of hardships in our life, sometimes we look all around us and we see nothing but darkness. Everything is closed. Everything is shut. I have nothing to live for. Hope becomes that little window where it allows a little tiny of light come in. When the light comes into my dark life, I have the hope to look forward and to live for. When the Lord was born, He gave me that hope of a new life ahead of me. When the Lord was baptized at the River Jordan, He gave me faith for this life. And without faith, there is nothing. But what made birth, hope, and baptism, faith, what made them possible? Love. Love. The Lord came to die and to rise. That was his aim. But you see, love precedes everything it's the supreme ethic love precedes everything however love precedes everything but never reveals itself at the very beginning love always hides love always hides itself when it's genuine love when it is true love when it is from the heart it never boasts about itself. It never reveals itself. And when you read 1 Corinthians 13, you will see love never boasts. Love is always humble down to earth. Love is always humble down to earth. The Lord Jesus suffered beyond measures to save us all suffered beyond measures and he rose from the dead to say I am love I have created you on the basis of love and the moment you broke my word you broke my heart that's why I was crucified what's crucifixion the heart is broken the heart is broken by the one whom he loves the most. The Lord's suffering was not the nails, not the lashes, not the whip. It was not the crown of thorns. It was not the nails that went into his hands and into his feet. This kind of a pain is only temporal because you can put a nail through the hand, 
But when you take it out after a month, after a year, the wound will heal and the pain will disappear. But there is one pain that will never disappear. The pain of the loved one walking away from you. When you love this person the most and this person whom you love the most denies you, betrays you, sells you and walks away from you and says, I do not know who this man is. This kind of a pain never fades away. Never. So what made the Lord suffer? Love. Because of his love. But he went ahead with it. And he created us knowing he will suffer at our hands. Love is crazy. Love is crazy. Until you love, you're sane. The moment you begin to love, you are insane. That's why when you see a married couple, they don't act normal. Actually, they act normal after 20, 30 years of marriage. But when they are at their early stage, you know, the Rosellas, I call them the Rosella state. Choo, 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 choo. You see them acting in a weird way, yet they are adults. When you love genuinely, you will act like a weirdo in front of the world. Yes. Parents act very weird when it comes to children. If they hear one little tiny thing about their child, they lose it. They, they go crazy. When the baby is born, from the moment that baby is born till that baby is actually a mature person and probably now ready to get married, they act like crazy. The baby has a temperature. Mom, dad, act like crazy. They will run to the doctor. They don't even care if they are in their pajamas or not. They don't care. My baby's got a temperature. I will do the impossible to make sure my baby is safe and sound and healthy. And as they grow, the more they grow, the older they become, the more troubled are mom and dad. Now they are a teenager. If they don't come back at a certain hour at home, mom can't sleep. Dad is worried. A hundred phone calls, where are you? You said you will be back at 11 p.m. It's 1 a.m. my son, my daughter. I cannot take it anymore. You better come right now. Acting like crazy. They get married and the parents are still troubled. They raise their children. Yet they've raised their children for 20, 30 years. And after that, they raise the children of their children. Why do you do that? Don't you want to have a break? I'd love to, to have a break. But tell the heart to stop loving. He can't. I remember my mom, God rest her soul in peace. When I used to go back home late, being a bishop, yeah, with Santa Claus beard, not a baby. In her pain and old age, taking so many medications, and painkillers that would put an elephant to sleep. Yet she would never sleep until she hears the door opening and closing. And I would go into the room just to check from a distance. She is fully alert, fully awake, 
and looking at me. So I'd walk up to her bed. She wouldn't be able to get up, poor mom. She was in a lot of pain. I say, naughty girl, why are you still awake till now? Hmm? You naughty, naughty. They said, hmm, you no home, me no sleep. Mom, I'm not a little kid. I'm a bishop. I'm an adult. You are a bishop for the church. For me, you're my son. You're my baby. You're my baby. If earthly parents act in such a way, how much more our heavenly father, who is the perfect love, the ultimate love, the, I can say confidently, the only true love. How much more? So when people say, why did Jesus die on the cross? What kind of a God is this? What kind of a God would come down and become a man? That is humility. God is too powerful. God is too exalted. God is too distant. God is beyond all of this for God to limit himself and become a human being living in this flesh, this weak flesh. What kind of a God? let alone this God becoming a man, then being dragged in the streets of Jerusalem, whipped, kicked, punched, spat on and told off and then nailed on the cross naked, fully naked from head to toe. What kind of a God is this? My dear friend, let me tell you, you have not understood the concept of love. You haven't. If you had understood the concept of love, you wouldn't have opened your mouth in the first place. You see, when God is love, love gives birth to children, not slaves. Is anybody home? Since God is love, love gives birth to sons, not slaves. Sons, not slaves. The master would not give one penny about their slave, but the father will hurt himself in order for this, for this child of his to be safe and sound. So God is love. Therefore, love gives birth to sons, not slaves. He is the father. And as the father, the father he will do the impossible to save his child he died on the cross what is dying on the cross love i love you so much i am willing to put my life on the line for you sacrifice love equals sacrifice and this is why the Lord Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross to say, this is what true love is all about. True love, even when it suffers the most, but cannot do anything but love. You can hurt me, but I will never hurt you. You can deny me, but I will never deny you. You can walk away from me, but I will never walk away from you. You can easily sell me with 30 pieces of silver, but I will purchase you with my own blood, my own life, because simply I am love and I love you. And love can only do one thing, is to love no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. Love can only love. There cannot be contradiction in true love. There cannot. This is why Jesus Christ will never change. This is why Jesus Christ will never change. Whether we love him or not, he is love. Whether we accept him or not, he is love. Whether we come or leave him, he is love. Parents 
can only love their children even if their children hurt them. Maybe the child walks away, leaves home, and live on their own. Deny mom and dad, but mom and dad, they will always shed tears for that child who walked away from them. Always. Like somebody put it this way. He said, when a father smacks his son for being naughty, you know, it's okay sometimes to smack him. Or in Australia, you're in deep trouble. They'll call triple zero and put you in the cage, Fairfield State Police Station. You got a life. I'm at least in might. I discipline my son my way. Okay? You government, leave me alone. I smack him on the nappy. When a father smacks the son, the son feels the pain. He may cry. He may not like his dad for that moment, for that day, for that week. But after a week, after a month, the son forgets the smack. The father never forgets that he once upon a time smacked his son. And every time the father remembers it, I'll say this. He never likes himself. Why did I smack my son? But the son forgets the father never. Because this is my son. I love him more than me. And if I hurt him, I'm hurting myself a million times moreover. If he sheds one tear, I shed a million. If he cries once, I'll cry a million. If he falls once, I'll fall a million. Because I'm dead. God is dead. God is dead. The ultimate name, the ultimate name you could ever call God is Father. This name makes him melt like a candle. You can call him the Almighty. You can call him the all-powerful. You can call him the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, Elohim, El, Sh El Shaddai. You can call him whatever name, and he is worthy of every name. But there is one name. He dies. He dies to hear it from his children. Every time you pray, say, Our Daddy who art in heaven. Look at the Lord. Can you teach us how to pray, Lord Jesus? He said, every time you pray, you say, our daddy. Now, by the way, the Lord taught the, uh, this prayer, the Lord's prayer. He taught it in Aramaic, Syriac, not in Hebrew, in Aramaic. Now, the Aramaic language is the informal. It's the slang. Hebrew was the formal language, the language of the book. But Aramaic is the slang language. So when you want to pray the Lord's Prayer, literally we should say, Our Daddy who art in heaven, not Father. Because the word Father is the formal way of referring to my Father. But the informal is Dad. When you living with your dad at home, do you call him Good Morning Father? Or do you call him, Hi Dad, how are you Dad? He's your dad. There is no formalities. There is no boundaries. There is no limits. He's your dad. You don't speak in the formal way. You speak informally. Why? Because daddy. I speak formal with strangers, but informal with family members. So the Lord prayer should transliterate into our daddy who art in heaven, not father. That's the Aramaic, Abon Bashmeyo or Awon Bashmeya. Abon or Awon literally means dad. Daddy. We need.
to come to learn how to love daddy. Looks like I have to watch what I say in public. <laughs> Because some people, they just like to check, put everything under the microscope and use it to their own benefits and attack. You can't say that. Theologically, it's not sound. Get a life, mate. Relax. I was having a fish burger with me dad. What's it to you, bro? I invited Jesus to Mecca's. Can you relax? It's unbelievable. You can't even talk freely with your dad in public. That's why I'll keep it to myself. They're still little kids in kindergarten. They don't, they don't understand the language of love. They're still kids. We'll send them the dummy with milk. Hopefully they'll grow a little bit all done. They start eating bread and meat. Those who are still fasting, no meat. But those who have finished their fasting can eat meat now. The Lord, before anything, before anything, Before anything, the Lord wants your heart. Don't ever come and say, I pray for you, Lord. I pray to you. And I, I sing for you, Lord. And I preach for you, Lord. And I celebrate the Holy Mass for you, Lord. And I build churches for you, Lord. And I brought millions of people for you, Lord. All of this is nothing. He wants your heart. Because the Lord can do it without you. It was His love. It was His mercy. It was His grace that used you to do all of these things. But it was Him doing it through you. Without Him, we cannot do anything. John 15, 5. Without Him, we cannot do anything. It is the love that moves mountains. It is the love that changes the heart. It is the love that brings out of death life, out of darkness light, and out of destruction construction. It is the love, the love. Nowhere in the entire existence, anyone can describe and illustrate love like Jesus done it. No one, ever. No one. The way the Lord Jesus spoke about love, The way the Lord Jesus lived that love, the way the Lord Jesus illustrated, defined, and revealed this love, no one can ever do this, not even one tiny little percent of it. No way. All the religious figures, zilch, zero. Jesus Christ is just one. There is no comparison. Just one unique person. Before anything, the Lord wants your heart. Don't say, I went to church on Sunday and I've done my duty. I've been fasting for 50 days. Hmm? No meat. That's an ultimate sacrifice. I gave up on chocolate for 50 days. I didn't watch television for 50 days. I started shivering at the end of the 50 days. I couldn't wait for Sunday resurrection to come so I can breathe again. I was choked. <laughs> That's not love. <laughs> If you live with someone and you're suffocating, That means there is no love. True? Why do people get far from all of you? But why do people get divorced? The moment love finishes, life finishes. There is no life. Everybody walks their way. 
that life, that household life is no longer in existence. Why? Because the moment that love finished from this household, life finished from that household. No more husband, wife, father, mother, children, no more. Why? Because love stopped, ended. When love finishes, you cannot live with the person, not even a second. Because that second is like eternity. It's hell. So what is hell? A place where there is no love. The Lord, the first thing he wants before you give up on chocolate, <laughs> before you give up on Mackets and hungry Jack, poor Jack has been hungry all his life. <laughs> I'll open a new franchisee called the field Jack. <laughs> Or maybe thirsty Jack. <laughs> this one is hungry, the other one is thirsty. We sell bottles of water and drinks, the other one sells hamburger. <laughs> that was a good one, wasn't it? Yeah. Hungry, thirsty Jack. And we'll open a third one called Crawl Jack. <laughs> Before you give up on anything, the Lord says, I want you to love me. That's the first thing. That's the foundational thing. Love me first, and then I'll teach you how to live for me, how to live with me. I'll teach you. So when you love, when you love somebody that is vegetarian, you'll become vegetarian for their sake. I'll give up because I'm not going to cook any, any meat and eat before them and they eat veggies, grass. So I'll give up on the meat. Why? Because I love you. I love meat, but I don't love meat more than you. So uh, away with me. I want you. You see, it becomes so easy to give up things for the one you love. Instead of fighting with yourself, struggling with yourself, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to fast. I don't know how to go to church. I don't know how to love the Lord. Just stop, stop, stop. You see, you realize one thing. You're saying, I don't know how to do it. I, the Lord said, forget about you. Come to me. Let me be you. Stop saying, I want to come. I want to do. Stop saying, I, I, I. No more. You live for me now. I live in you. Let me be you. Let me do everything for you. All I want is your heart. Lord, but my heart is full of spider webs. My heart is, is a piece of wreck. My heart, there's a lot of ugly things. Jealousy, envy, pride, hatred, foolishness, ignorance. There's so many things. Give me your heart. I am love. I know how to fix things. Give me your heart. When you focus on learning by begging the Lord, teach me how to love you, Lord. I want to love you, but I don't know how. Please teach me, Lord. Show me the way. I want to give you my heart, but I don't know how. I don't know where, when, how, what to do. Show me. The Lord will when you are genuine in your request. When the Lord enters the heart, everything else falls in its place naturally. Without a sweat, without a struggle, without arguing and fighting. Some people, they want to go and fast. They end up fighting with themselves. I'm going to fast. I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going to drink anything. And they spend the entire fasting period fighting with themselves. They lost track of the Lord. Satan came, made them too busy fighting with themselves and fighting with everyone else. Come, let's go. I'm fasting. I can't. I'm tired. Can't you see? I can't move. I haven't eaten all day. 
Relax, brother. Eat. Don't fight with your family members. You fight with your family and you say, I'm fasting. He broke your fast. What fast? Anyone home? It's the love. The love. When you love the Lord, oh, I can fast. I don't have a problem. Because your love filled me up, baby. I just done me fingernails. It cost me a hundred dollars at Fairfield Nita City. And I told them to put a diamond ring in this little one. Now it's old fashioned now. They go to Istanbul, facelift, yalla. When you truly love, everything becomes easy. Everything becomes doable. Everything makes sense. When there is no love, nothing makes sense. Nothing is easy. Everything is crazy. So what is Sunday resurrection? Love. Divine love revealed for the human race, the entire human race. The Lord Jesus is the creator of every human being. Whether they accept it, not acknowledge it, not profess it, confess it, not. That's the truth. It will never change. Sooner or later, they will find out and they will get the shock of their life. That there is only one God and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the creator of every human being. Black, white, yellow, red, whatever. Everyone. Love in Christianity. Totally different to every religion out there. To every religion out there. Nothing to do. The way the love is illustrated in Christianity through this perfect God, perfect man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There is none like it anywhere in the entire existence. Not just the world, in the entire existence, none like it. No one defines love the way Jesus defines it. No one. Not Buddha, not Krishna, not Muhammad, not any religious figure. With all love and respect, I'm saying no one defines love the way Jesus Christ of Nazareth defines it. No one. And by the way, I'll leave you with this. Love is an absolute. Absolute means no beginning, no end. Limitless. There are many absolutes in life. But I'll give you the four foundational absolutes of all other absolutes. There are four foundational ones. First, love. Second, justice. Third, evilness. Fourth, forgiveness. Love, justice, evilness, forgiveness. These four absolutes are foundational. These four absolutes, love, justice, evilness, forgiveness, converged all together and they were fully defined and fully illustrated in one place called Golgotha, Calvary, where Jesus Christ was crucified on there. On the cross, love, justice, evil, forgiveness were fully defined and fully illustrated by the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father cried out from heaven and said to the entire human race, I am love and on the basis of love I have created you. And the day you broke my word, my justice cried out. For the wages of sin is death. This is the justice of God to every human being that breaks the word of God. I created you on the basis of love. But when you broke my word, my justice cried out and said, Adam, the day you break my word, surely you shall die. But Jesus Christ became the latter Adam 
took the place of the former Adam and said to his daddy, I will die in the place of the former Adam. And the former Adam is the entire human race. So Jesus, the latter Adam died on the cross to do, to justify, to pay the justice of God back. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died on the cross. God's justice was fully paid back. And then he shed his blood, his precious blood on the cross. And he cried, and that blood cried out and said, with this blood, I wash the evil of every human being that accepts me as Lord and Savior. I wash their evilness with my precious blood. And when he washed the evilness of those who accepted him as Lord and Savior, he cried out from the cross and said, Father, Daddy, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. The Lord Jesus illustrated fully love, justice, evilness, and forgiveness on the cross. No one ever had done this except Jesus. So many people talk out of ignorance, not knowing who Christ is and what Christianity is all about. And they talk very premature, very childish. What kind of a God that dies on the cross? Please, you need to grow up. You need to understand what love is all about. You need to understand what justice is all about. You need to understand what evilness is all about. You need to understand what forgiveness is all about. The Lord rose from the dead to say to those who receive him as Lord and Savior, I love you. I paid the price for you. I forgive you. I washed away all your evilness. Now, in return, I'll ask you for one thing. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? That's the only question. The Lord will never ask you any other question. The Lord will never say, why didn't you preach for me? The Lord will never say, why didn't you sing for me? The Lord will never say, why didn't you fast for me? Why didn't you pray? Why didn't you come to church? The Lord will say, why didn't you love me? Do you love me? The Lord asked one question after his resurrection to Simon Peter to teach us all and to reveal to us all. This is the only question I will ask you when you come to me. When I call you to me, it's the only question. Don't expect questions, one only. Do you love me? If you can answer this question, heaven is all yours. But if you cannot answer this question, you cannot enter heaven because heaven is all about love. And I won't force you to live with someone you do not love, even if that someone is God. But in order to love him, you need to know him. Who can know God? No one. But do you know your dad? Of course. Your dad is not a stranger, but God is. You ask those people who believe in God, do you know him? They'll say no. Well, if you don't know him, what kind of a worship is this? Who are you kidding? Who are you bluffing? Have you seen God? No. Do you see God? No. Can you get to God? No. Do you know God? No. Can you ever know God? No. I serve him. What a liar. But when will you know this God? When this God becomes your dad. Now, do you know your dad? Of course. If you don't know your dad, then you've got a problem. This is why I love my dad. Because I came to know dad. And through knowing him, it led me to loving him. Because I cannot claim to love someone I do not know. I can only love the one whom I know. So what leads to love is knowledge. And to get to know him, he cannot be a stranger. 
He cannot be the unreachable God. He needs to be within your reach. That's why I could not, I could not go up to him. He came down to me. What's wrong with that? How come on one hand you claim God is the almighty, but you say God cannot be a human. Then where is his almightiness then? If God cannot be a human, he is no longer God because he cannot do anything and everything. Since he cannot do anything and everything, then he is not God. So which God are you worshiping? Can God become a man? Yes. If not, he is not God. Because God can do anything and everything. That means he can become a human being. So in Christianity, we don't just say the human Jesus became God. No, we say God became the human Jesus. Right? Not the human became God. No, God became man. Not man became God. That is wrong. But God became man. That is absolutely fine. Because he is almighty. He can do anything and everything. And since he is love, wouldn't he want to be one of the, one of his own creation? The ultimate creation, the crown of all creations, the human race. He loves the animal because he created the animal. He loves the plant because he created the plant. He loves the fish. He created the fish. But the ultimate of all creations is his son, the human being, his image and likeness. All creations have a soul and a body, except the human race has an extra element, the spirit. That's why animals will not enter heaven because they don't have a spirit. So if you're in love with your pet, sorry, your pet will stay here. Won't come to paradise. Well, you're going to have dogs and cats running around in paradise. Come on, man. If you want to see them, go to Toronto Zoo. The human being has the spirit, the intellect. The intelligent human being is the spirit. That's why the lion can shred me to pieces, but I can, I can deceive the lion and put him in a cage and put him in a, in a zoo and make money out of a lion. He's not as smart as a human being. Because we are the only ones who are created in the image and the likeness of God. Intelligence. Creative. We are creators. Co-creators with God. Love the Lord Jesus, my beloved. Love the Lord Jesus. Love the Lord Jesus and let him work in you and show you how to live for him. Then I can assure you going to church will be just a natural instinct. Before mom and dad used to drag me. Please, I want to sleep. Now I just go naturally. Because when you want to meet the one you love, you'll go naturally. And the last thing you look at when you, with, when you are with the one you love is the time. You don't look at the time, do you? Because the time will take you away from your sweetheart. You will never look at the time. So when, when I'm in the church, I don't look at the time. That's why I preach for hours on end. Bishop, you preach for too long. No, it's not too long. I'm just with my sweetheart. There is no time. Padre Pio said that. All the saints said that. When you're in the presence of the Lord, time ceases. Why? Because I'm with my love. And when I'm with my love, there is no time. Because the time cannot take me away from my love. So I want to stay here forever. Because I'm with my sweetheart. The love of my life, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Love the Lord, baby. Come on. Be strong. Be men, even if you're women. And don't be LGBTQ, RST, if you are Z. What a sick world. <laughs> and please uh, walk away from this uh, new uh, sort of... Um, idea that love embraces everyone and love loves everyone love loves everyone but love is just and fair 
and disciplines. Yeah? So for you to accept everything in the name of love, <laughs> that's, that's not the love of Christ. That's not the love of Christ. We love everyone, yes, but we cannot accept <clears throat> certain lifestyles and certain behaviors. We cannot. We pray for everyone, yes. But we cannot accept everyone's way of living. Otherwise, where do you draw the line? The problem with the atheist, there is no line. And the reason why there is no line, because they say when you die, that's it, you come to an end. What a, what a sad end. So why did you study and become a professor at university? You've spent all your life studying to become a professor to, to end up in being nothing. Might as well just start with a nothing. Why did you work hard? Why did you spend hours on end studying and going through exams and assignments? For what? For an end that goes into nothing? Well, if you choose this, then why should I listen to you, Mr. Professor? I don't want to be a nothing. <laughs> I want to be something. <laughs> so I'm not going to listen to you. I don't care how educated you are because it looks like you're nothing. See, with love, everything has a meaning and a purpose. Everything. Everything. Let's bow our heads. I spoke for too long. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all. Pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants, and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit, by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion, from all flesh and spiritual blemishes and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the walks of their behavior in the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will. To confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you. May the Lord Jesus guide you, protect you, and deliver you from the snares of the enemy always, my beloveds. Always.